Allied defense ministers met at NATO headquarters in Brussels. The meeting was chaired by the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Good afternoon, this is Henry Keane on UATV English. Our team is here to bring some hard truth in easy terms for the whole free world directly from Ukraine. The Secretary General of Alliance, Jens Stoltenberg, previewed the actual ministerial meeting with a press conference on 14th of February. Addressing the media, he pointed to historic progress in increased defense investment. By the end of 2024, he said European allies and Canada will have added more than $600 billion for defense since we made the defense investment pledge. He said, adding that he expects 18 allies to spend 2% of their GDP on defense this year. Well, in easy terms, it's huge and it's coming. We need, uh, of course, to do both, uh, to, to, to do two, two things at the same time. We need to be able to uh, deliver um, ammunition in the short term, meaning that we need to continue to dig into our own stocks. We need to uh, uh, see if there is possible to buy ammunition from outside NATO uh, countries, and allies have done that. Uh, uh, and we need to also be able to ramp up production from existing factories. More shifts uh, uh, has been a way to actually increase uh, production from uh, existing production uh, capacity. But in the longer term, we need to increase also the production capacity. And therefore, I welcome decisions not only by Germany, but also from other allies to invest more to ramp up production. Um, and that's the way we will ensure that we're able to both continue to support Ukraine with a steady flow of ammunition, but also to uh, replenish our own stocks, which are, have now been depleted uh, to enable us to support uh, Ukraine. Ministers also discussed progress in ramping up ammunition production. The Secretary General made clear that there is need to shift from the slow pace of peacetime to the high tempo production demanded by conflicts in order to refill stocks and continue to support Ukraine. In the past month, NATO has agreed contracts worth $10 billion. This helps Ukraine, makes NATO stronger and provides more highly skilled jobs in Europe and North America, Mr. Stoltenberg said. Ministers also addressed the deteriorating security environment. Better late than never, right? The Security General confirmed that while we do not see any imminent military threat against the alliance, NATO continues to ensure there is no room for miscalculation in Moscow about our readiness to protect all allies. With Steadfast Defender 24, the largest NATO exercise in decades, currently ongoing, allies are demonstrating capabilities and testing their ability to swiftly move forces across the alliance to defend the eastern flank. Allies also held a conversation with Ukrainian Defense Minister Rostem Omerov, who remotely joined the meeting. Today we're signing a drone coalition, which will have several directions. This is the production of drones, systems and financial support. It will be provided for the production of drones both in Ukraine and outside Ukraine together with partners. The issue of artillery coalition was also discussed, where we will either manufacture them together, systems will be provided and there will also be financing. There is a fairly good list of capabilities that our partners will provide. Godspeed. Underlining the importance of continued support, Mr. Stoltenberg welcomed recent announcements of support, including from Canada, Finland and Norway, covering key capabilities like F-16s, equipment and spare parts. As well as air defense, of course, he further welcomed that a group of allies is coming together with the goal of delivering one million drones to Ukraine, and that 20 NATO allies have agreed to form a demining coalition for Ukraine. Well, what can I say? I'm really sorry it had to be the war in Ukraine to grant a chance for Europe finally to become united indeed in the face of Russian aggression. From this February 16th to 18th, the 60th Munich Security Conference, MSC, an anniversary, by the way, took place. The event once again became an epicenter of international diplomacy, Munich Security Conference. What is it in easy terms, after all? In very easy terms, it's the biggest security summit on the planet.
EMSC assembles more than 450 senior decision makers, as well as thought leaders from around the world, including heads of states, ministers, leading personalities or international and non-government organizations, high-ranking representatives from business, the media, academia and civil society to debate pressing issues of international security policy. And of course, Ukraine was present. The conference today represents different parts of the world. And, and of course, many nations. Among us, there is no one for whom the ongoing war in Europe does not pose a threat. This war defines more than just, just the place of Ukraine or entire Europe in the world. This is Russia's war against any rules at all. But how long? But how long will the world let Russia be like this? This is the main question today. The longer this Russian aggression against the rules-based world order continues, the greater are the changes it provokes. Indeed. So what is clear as of today? It is clear at least that Russia's aggression still shapes citizens' views of other countries, but MSC says less intensely than last year. While still Belarus, China, Iran and Russia are the only countries that are seen more as threats than as allies in aggregate, the Munich Security Index 2024, whatever that is, signals, I quote MSC website, a moderation of the post-Russian invasion trends. Almost all indicators related to Russia's war on Ukraine have fallen, they say, including the use of nuclear weapons by Russian aggressor. Uh, what a relief! U.S. Senate goes on recession, MSC nuclear index drops, so all good, right? Let us buy some Matryoshka dolls on the internet and befriend Putin on Facebook. I just wonder what that MSC index showed before 24th February 2022, when all experts said there will be no war, remember? And what that index will be showing if tomorrow the Kremlin just blasts all the mines those idiots have gathered in Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Then I guess the world and the MSC will suddenly have to invent a new relevant nuclear fallout index and diplomats will be like, oh, who would ever imagine, who would ever thought all our nuclear threat indexes showed decline just about yesterday. Well, dear sirs or madams of MSC, let us in Ukraine add some reality right from the actual battlefield to your calming agenda. Based on the operational situation around Avdiivka, in order to avoid encirclement and preserve the lives and health of servicemen, I decided to withdraw our units from the city and move to defense on more favorable lines. Our soldiers performed their military duty with dignity, did everything possible to destroy the best Russian military units, inflicted significant losses on the enemy in terms of manpower and equipment. We are taking measures to stabilize the situation and maintain our positions. The life of military personnel is the highest value. You. We will still return Avdiivka. Alexander Sirsky, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, on Facebook. I have no doubt about that, sir. Also, Yulia Navalny was at MSC exactly when Russia announced that Alexei Navalny had died in jail. You see, Alexei Navalny was never a hero here in Ukraine in terms of his, to put it mildly, controversial metaphors on Ukraine in general and Crimea in particular. Just Google it. But whatever it is to Russians, two things are clear to Ukrainians. Alexei Navalny did not die in jail. As the Kremlin puts it, Navalny was murdered in jail. It for sure was not the case in Ukraine. However, millions of Russians considered Alexei Navalny a symbol of freedom, of hope, a new Russian wave of sorts, a person of renaissance. Now, Navalny became a martyr, murdered by Vladimir Putin. And what? Have you heard any noise in Russia, let alone the revolution? No, nothing. No protests. No public outrage. There's just silence. Just a few arrests, maybe, that's all. And that is exactly what tells the biggest difference between Ukrainians and Russians. We better die fighting than living like that in the silence of the lambs. 
But on the contrary to Russians, some kept on talking no matter what. President of Colombia said on X social network, in a world where everyone talks about war, Colombia talks about peace. Pardon me? Are you saying it was our Ukrainian choice to talk about war, President Gustavo? You think we asked Russia to invade, murder, rape and abduct us here in Ukraine so we could have a pretext to talk about war while you could talk about peace and look better on our backdrop? In case you still have not noticed it, in Colombia, President, you can't stop a criminal by talking sense to him. So talkers might keep on talking all they want, still talking about good weather during the rain never actually brings sunshine. Talking about peace never stopped any war. Appeasing a monster was never a way to peace, but a way to greater aggression. That is the bare fact, the aftermath, the price you pay for talking instead of acting in the face of a threat. And if, God forbid, Russians would have invaded Colombia, I'd love to see you, President Gustavo, talking about peace. But whoever says whatever, in particular in general, Ukraine expects a lot from MSC. And these great expectations are based on a very simple grounds, a great Russian danger for the whole world that Russia has well proven to be real by invading Ukraine. The United States Senate voted in favor of a package bill that includes $60 billion to support Ukraine, with 66 senators out of required 60 supporting the document. The bill is being considered without the sensitive issue of the southern border after Republicans blocked the initial draft. Well, you know, I am 48 years old. I've seen enough in my life to understand that politics, which I sincerely love, loves no one in return. Those looking for love or friendship in politics should just resign. There are allies and opposers. Both are temporary. Sometimes you can just wait for one to become the other, but not in terms of war. We in Ukraine just do not have that luxury of waiting. And thank God there are senators that clearly see that. I can't see into the future, but there are no guarantees that Ukraine will defeat Russia but that does not mean that we should stand back and let Putin have his way with Europe. What sending weapons to Ukraine does do is help discourage further Russian and Chinese invasions, which could draw us in. It helps preserve NATO. It allows America to remain the leader of the free world. And it shows that we honor our word to our friends and allies. I'm struggling to understand one thing here. The House of Representatives that goes for recession during World War III in the middle of Europe represents what exactly? I mean by procrastinating the measure that literally should be saving tens of thousands of lives in Ukraine, what is the message? The fact that a lot of Americans do not believe that by aiding Ukraine, they are investing in own insurance so the American soldiers won't have to set foot onto European battlefield fighting Russian fascism this time, does not mean it is not actually the case. It actually is the case. Looking back at the history, we see clearly dictators never stop and Putin won't. So House of Representatives today represents Putin's happy hours as Russian Tsar succeeded in delaying paying his final bill for what he did to Ukraine and the world. However, this way or the other, the bill has passed. As Mitch McConnell, minority leader of the United States Senate, has put it nicely, history settles every count. On the value of American leadership and strength, history will record that the Senate did not blink. And now we all wait for the House of Representatives to represent not only the ability to recess, but some courage in actually defending human values and not lending money to those who spill their blood for it, as Donald Trump suggested. Unless Mr. Trump does not mind collecting the profit of his loan investment in dead bodies of Ukrainian soldiers who were murdered by Russia while he was negotiating the interest rate fee. Time for more on your native English. You ask hard questions, we answer in easy terms. The question of the week has been voiced by our dear viewer, Kate George 7338 And the question sounded like, 
Will Ukraine attack the Russian nuclear power stations and make Russia uninhabitable if it has no other option? Well, first of all, thank you for your question, Kate. You know, Russia, no matter what murder Putin thinks, is not actually the only country on the face of the earth. So that no option aftermath of our attack for the world, what does it mean? A nuclear fallout? Millions in death toll? Scorched earth? Mutations in generations to come? Well, that might sound like victory, Kate. Just way too pyrrhic one, isn't it? Well, I can't tell exactly, of course, what will be the decision of our Ukrainian military command and what they would see as the no other option situation for going nuclear. That I don't know. But what I know, that experts were having one voice two years ago when saying there will be no war in Ukraine, calm down, already Putin won't attack. And then on 24th of February came the reality, and here we are today. I'm sure it is exactly the same thing with that will Putin go nuclear question. Some may say, Henry, you're pushing it too hard and too far. Well, I hate to break it to you like that, but Comrade Putin, in fact, is already using nuclear power plants as a time bomb. The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, is the perfect example. The plant is mined. Again, a nuclear power plant is mined by Russians. Weapons and explosives everywhere. One of the reactors is constantly kept in a hot circuit state, which creates a great nuclear danger not only for Ukraine, but also for the entire Eastern Europe. Does all that qualify for an attack on NATO countries yet? Or we have to wait until it actually happens, just as is the case with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Although, as we saw with those Russian drones in Romania, if they explode in NATO territory, this is not somehow yet an attack on NATO. So come down. I'm sure Russia does not want nuclear fallout pollution in Ukraine, of course. Or maybe it does. And we, the victims of aggression, as martyrs, will go to heaven while they will just die, because they will not even have time to repent. See? If you insist on my firm answer, dear Kate George 7338, well, here it is. If Western laziness, irresponsibility and complacency are to prevail over harsh reality, well, then we in Ukraine won't even have to bother to attack. Russia most certainly will attack itself, the West, first. And then those survived will rip their hair off in an attempt to remember why, for God's sake, did not the world strike back by helping Ukraine to win while it could. Well, that seems to be it for tonight and for the week. It was Henry Keane in Creative English breaking the hard truth to easy terms for the whole free world directly from Ukraine. As usual, if you like the job that we did for you, please let us help. It is even somewhat mutual. Like us in return. Subscribe. Share. Help us to promote the Ukrainian voice worldwide. Please also do not hesitate to express your own opinion in the comments below. It matters a lot to us. Ask us a question so next week we could do our best to answer it. Well, stay safe and tune for more right already tomorrow. See you.